All right. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's webinar, Peyton Randolph, who's a PhD student in David Liu's lab at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. He has assisted in the initial development of prime editing and co-authored several papers in that field, including the study being presented today. He also co-led the efforts to engineer prime editing guide RNAs or PEC RNAs for resistance to degradation and improved prime editing efficiency. And he's currently working on um, in vivo applications for prime editing for therapeutic benefits. And this research is being supported by the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And with that, Peyton, thank you so much for being here today. And the floor is all yours. Well, thank you, uh, Renata, for that very kind introduction. And uh, now for my own, for our speaker today. So it's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce now Dr. Uh, Jordan Doman. So prior to coming to Harvard for her doctoral research in David Liu's group, Jordan earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, performing undergraduate research on using Xenon 129 for novel biosensing applications in the lab of Ivan Mahovsky. Uh, based on this work and other aspects of her outstanding academic achievements, Jordan was selected for both the Hertz Foundation and NSF GRFP fellowships, uh, which have supported a fantastically productive graduate career, advancing both base and prime editors, work that is now being leveraged in an ongoing clinical trial for T-cell leukemia. Uh, befitting her broad scientific interests, Dr. Doman will begin her research in neuroscience, studying microglia under Professor Beth Stevens, as a new Harvard Junior Fellow in the fall. And with that, uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much, Peyton and Renaud and everyone else um, from BioProtocol. Let me get my screen shared here. OK, can everyone see and hear? OK, great. Um, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. I am really thrilled to tell you all about some of the work going on in the Lab right now um, to develop and enhance prime editing for experiments um, in mammalian cells in this case, but um, they have many other applications too. So feel free to, um, you know, if any questions come to you throughout the talk, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, we can just get started. Okay, so. Um, just to kind of give you all an idea of what we'll be going over today, um, I think it's important to talk about when we should even be using prime editing relative to other genome editing technologies, what are kind of its optimal use cases. We'll discuss how prime editing works, and then we'll spend most of the time today on this third point, which is how you should design and optimize a prime editing strategy for a brand new target of interest for your, you know, your own project and your own applications. Um, we'll kind of finish off by doing some example applications. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about two of my coworkers' recent publications just within the past month that use prime editing for some really interesting therapeutic applications, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, so feel free to use the chat. So just to dive right in, if you're attending this webinar, you're probably interested in genome editing. And at this point in time, there are really, um, it's a really complete and robust toolbox that we have for genome editing in many different organisms. Kind of the first um, iteration of this and, um, you know, really big breakthrough was Cas9 nuclease. And traditionally, when people use Cas9 nuclease, you're targeting the Cas9 protein to induce a double-stranded DNA break at a target site in cells. And, um, you know, if you just do this, you'll generate indels or insertions and deletions at the target locus. Um, and if you add a DNA donor, you can do HDR or homology-directed repair to install specific mutations. Other tools developed later on from the Lou Lab are base editing, which can convert um, specific bases to other bases, so C to T or A to G, and we refer to these as transition mutations. Um, unlike Cas9 nuclease, these do not go through a double-stranded break intermediate, which is really useful, but again, they can only do these transition mutations. And the subject of today's talk is going to be prime editing, in which you use a reverse transcriptase fused to a Cas9 nickase to kind of synthesize this DNA flap intermediate. And you can use it to install any small DNA change, and you can use some kind of um, improved and enhanced versions of prime editing to make even larger changes to the genome. <laughs> 
and you know, Cast9 Nuclease, space editing and prime editing, they all have their pros and cons, right? If you just wanted to knock out a gene, for example, you might just want to use Cas9 nuclease. It's efficient, it's fairly easy to do, um, but the downside is that it does only generate indels and you often can't control what these indels are. Let's say you wanted to install um, you know, a specific mutation in an HDR competent cell type, then maybe you would use HDR. Um, it can be really versatile and very efficient in the cell types that it works in, but unfortunately it doesn't work in all cell types such as post mitotic cells. And because you're still going through a double-stranded DNA break, it can lead to other undesired consequences like um, large deletions, um, indels at the target site, large um, translocations, um, other undesired byproducts such as that. Um, base editing, like I mentioned, is very efficient and they're very, very good at what they do, but they're only limited to transition mutations, so C to T and A to G changes. And that kind of leads us to prime editing, which in a lot of ways is kind of a lot of the good qualities of all three of these technologies wrapped into one. So it's versatile. You can install any mutation that you want as long as it's small. And like I said, there are ways to manipulate prime editing for larger changes. Um, and if you optimize your prime editing approach well, you can have very low indels and very efficient levels of editing. And it's been shown to work in a wide variety of cell types. So um, primary um, cortical neurons isolated from mice, it works in vivo in the CNS, it works in the liver, in plant cells, E. coli. So it's really versatile, it's really flexible, and it can be really efficient. So it's a really powerful technology. But the downside of prime editing is that it requires a bit more optimization and a bit more time spent on your editing technique than some of these other technologies that I just talked about. Um, but that's kind of what we're here to address today. So how does prime editing work? So I mentioned that prime editing um, uses a prime editor protein, and it also uses this modified CRISPR guide RNA called a PEG RNA. A prime editor protein is made of a Cas9 nickase fused to a reverse transcriptase, and the PEG RNA that it uses is in some ways very similar to a normal CRISPR guide RNA, so it has this scaffold sequence that can bind to the Cas9, and it also has a spacer, just like normal guide RNAs that targets it to a certain spot in the genome. What it has that most CRISPR technologies don't use is this 3' prime PEG RNA extension, and we'll get into what exactly is in there in a minute. But let's say that you've managed to deliver your prime editor and your PEG RNA into a cell to do genome editing. The two associate, and then the guide RNA is able to target the prime editor protein to a specific spot in the genome. Because you're using a Cas9 nickase instead of a nuclease, it will nick just one strand, so just this top strand of DNA, and that frees this um, three prime flap of genomic DNA. And this is where that three prime extension that I mentioned comes in. So what you have now is you have this genomic flap that you've generated from your NIC, and you can design this three prime extension to have basically any sequence you want. And we kind of split it into two parts. So the very end is what we call the PBS or primer binding site. And then immediately after that is the RT template. So what do we design these things to do? So the PBS is designed to be complementary to this genomic flap that you've generated. So it base pairs with the DNA from the genomic flap and you create this DNA RNA duplex from the PBS in the genome. This is then recognized as a substrate from your reverse transcriptase enzyme that is fused to the Cas9 nickase. And the enzyme will start reverse transcribing using the genome as a primer and it will add bases onto it based on what is encoded in the RT template. So you're able to kind of dictate whatever you want to put into the genome based on the sequence of your RT template. So for example, you might encode maybe two bases that you want to edit by um, encoding those changes in the RT template. The RT will synthesize those bases onto the end of your genomic DNA flap. And it's also very important to include downstream homology in your RT template as well. And that's because when the reverse transcriptase is done with its job and it finishes synthesizing the RTT templated bases, this complex will fall off and you'll be left with a flap with your edit, but also this downstream homology. The downstream homology allows the flap with your edit to kind of lay down and kneel into the genome. And then you have what we call flap equilibration. And in a series of DNA repair steps that we kind of partially but don't fully understand, this intermediate is either resolved as the edit being permanently installed, or it can also be reverted back to the wild type sequence. So this is kind of the general cascade of prime editing events for what we call the PE2 system.
So to kind of update everyone on some nomenclature, PE1 is the original prototype prime editor where uh, members of our lab just kind of stuck together the MMLV reverse transcriptase and Cas9 negase. PE2 is a huge improvement over PE1, and it uses mutations in the MMLVRT that enhance its activity. So basically, there's no reason to use PE1 anymore. PE2 is kind of our baseline prime editing system, and it's useful for a lot of applications. However, we kind of run into trouble with these arrows here. So this intermediate can be either um, you know, repaired as we wanted to with the edited um, sequence being permanently installed, or it can be reverted back to the wild type sequence based on this bottom strand here. Um, and this is dictated by cellular MMR. So there are a few different advances to prime editing that have allowed us to kind of enhance this arrow here towards the edited sequence in a way from reversion to the wild type sequence. One thing you can do is you can just add another guide RNA. So it's not a PEG RNA, it's just a normal CRISPR guide RNA. And this, because it's, you know, there's no three prime extension, the only job of the second guide RNA is just to direct the prime editor protein to nick this opposite strand. Because mammalian mismatch repair is nick directed, the addition of this nick kind of confuses the cellular MMR machinery. And instead of reverting things back to wild type, it becomes more likely to install your edited sequence. Another way that we can kind of bias these MMR outcomes in favor of the edited allele is by adding the MLH1DN, which is a dominant negative mutant of the protein um, from the MMR pathway MLH1. So this inhibits cellular mismatch repair and much like the NIC um, that we just talked about, kind of shunts these um, intermediate products towards the edited outcome. So when we have just a nicking guide, we call that PE3. When we have just MLH1DN, we call that PE4, and when we have both of them, we call that PE5. So this is kind of the landscape of prime editing systems that are available to us. So how do we use them? Um, there are, you know, there are so many different things that you can do with Prime, but no matter, basically no matter what your application is, you're going to start with these five steps that are common to basically any Prime editing project. You'll start off by selecting your target edit. You'll find protospacers that can target that edit. You'll optimize your PBS and RT template lengths, find nicking guides, and then select one of the PE systems that we just talked about. Um, something I haven't mentioned, but we'll get there, is the addition of silent edits. And between these five things, you can really, um, if you kind of carefully go through them all, um, you can really get efficient prime editing out, especially if you're willing to kind of iterate and optimize your editing approach. By doing this, you'll have you know, um, a way to hopefully very efficiently stall your edit of choice. And then there are many different ways prime editors have already been used. Um, the two that we're gonna go over today is RNA delivery for ex vivo editing of therapeutically relevant cells. And then we're also going to discuss dual AAV delivery of prime editors. But like I said, prime editors have been used in many different organisms. So um, you know, if you have an application in mind, it's probably at least worth thinking about. So just to kind of dive right in with the first thing we might want to do, um, step one is to select a target protospacer. So let's say that you've identified the base that you want to change, and you'll start off by scanning the locus for PAMs. So much like um, all these other Cas9-derived tools, prime editors use SPCAS9, and it requires a PAM or a protospacer adjacent motif, which is made up of NGG, so N being any base, and then two Gs. So you'll identify PAMs that are near your target base, and the PAMs will dictate um, a corresponding protospacer, so the 20 base pairs immediately um, preceding the PAM. We tend to prioritize target protospacers that are very close to the target edit. Um, this is not a perfect assumption, but you definitely don't want to be using protospacers that are exceptionally far away. So we'll prioritize the most proximal protospacer. And the only other thing you really need to consider when selecting a protospacer is that if there's one that would necessitate you to include a long poly T sequence in the plasmid encoding your PEG RNA, you should avoid that because those poly T sequences can prematurely truncate the expression of RNAs from the U6 promoter. So um, these are kind of the two um, things to keep in mind. You wanna be close to your target base and you wanna avoid poly T stretches. If we zoom into this target protospacer two, we can start to design the rest of the PEG RNA. So, like I mentioned, there's a PAM here, this TGG, and this dictates what the protospacer is, the 20 base pairs before the PAM. Cas9 nicks between um, positions 17 and 18 of the protospacer, so the nick will occur right here. 
And the only bases that are prime editable are the ones downstream of the nick, right? Because we're going to be adding bases onto this top strand after the nick. So for example, if your target edit was here, um, you wouldn't be able to access it by prime editing with this protospacer in PAM. But because our desired edit is over here, so plus 11, meaning 11 bases away from the nick, um, let's say that we wanted to change this G to a T. Um, what are the other components of the peg RNA that we would have to design in order to do this? So um, just to kind of keep everyone on the same page, this is what a state of the art peg RNA looks like. You have this spacer and this corresponds to the same sequence as the protospacer shown in the DNA here. So this will target the editor to the target locus. This scaffold is consistent for most SPCAS9 applications. It's just what the Cas9 binds to to recognize the guide RNA. So that is basically constant no matter what you're doing. Um, the other constant part of the PEG RNA that we haven't talked about is this TiVo pre-Q1 motif. So it stands for trimmed EVO pre-Q1, and it's just a highly structured motif that is used to stabilize the PEG RNA, prevents its degradation, and this really improves prime editing efficiencies um, quite a bit across the board. And this was actually an advance that was co-invented by Peyton, so um, we'll direct any questions about this to him later on. So beyond these kind of constant scaffold and TiVo pre-Q1 motifs, in addition to the spacer that we've already talked about, the two things that we need to address are the PBS and RTT. And the main ways that we change these are by their lengths. So you can imagine that we could extend this PBS to have either you know, more homology to the nicked um, flap that forms or kind of um, be shorter and be complementary to less of the flap. For the RTT, we know it's always going to start at the NIC because that's where the RT will start reverse transcribing. We know it's always going to contain the target edit. So for us, we want to change this G to a T. So we'll template that with an A in the PEG RNA. But we don't know how long to extend it for. So how much downstream homology do we want the RT template to encode? So these are kind of the two lengths that we play with. How much hybridization do we want the PBS to have? And how much downstream homology do we want the RTT to encode? To give you a ballpark of the um, you know, lengths that we typically use for these, almost all PBSs, it's pretty easy. They'll usually fall between eight and 15 base pairs. So we'll usually select maybe three within this window to start out with. And this is pretty agnostic to the edit type. Um, it's kind of always in this range. The RTT is a little bit more complicated because it depends on the edit that you're encoding. So you definitely want to have downstream homology no matter what the edit is. But kind of what we typically do in the lab is if we're doing a small change, like the single base pair change, you don't need so much downstream homology, maybe, you know, 10 or so bases. Um, you know, we're kind of varying the total RTT length between 18 and 24 for this edit. But if you had, for example, a longer edit, maybe you're inserting a flag tag like people have done in the original prime editing paper, you would want more downstream homology because of the larger change. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the other concern for the RTT length is that you don't want it to be at a length such that the first base of it is a C. Um, we've found that that can disrupt interactions with the guide RNA scaffold. So that's just kind of a, pit, a pitfall to avoid. So these are the um, things that we consider. And typically when we're designing a new prime editing strategy in our lab, we'll pick a couple PBS lengths, a couple RT temp template lengths, and then the number of PEG RNAs that we test is just kind of a matrix of those. So if you were to design three and three, it would be nine PEG RNAs for you know, kind of an initial first pass screen. So that's everything that we needed to cover for the PEG RNA. Um, but you know, you also will probably want to be, oh yes, and remember to always include the EPEG modification because it's really helpful for editing. So in addition to the PEG RNA, um, you'll probably want to design nicking guide RNAs because they're really also very helpful for boosting editing efficiency. We want to be nicking the opposite strand relative to where um, the prime editing is happening. So if your um, PAM and EPEG RNA spacer are on the top strand, you'll want to look for PAMs on the bottom strand for your nicking guide. Um, the other consideration for the nicking guide is that typically, although not always, um, these nicking guide locations in the plus direction or kind of on this side of the nick tend to perform better than nicking guides that target the minus direction, such as over here. So for example, you might want to prioritize these nicking guides um, if you, you know, have several options. <laughs> 
The other consideration for nicking guides is that if you get very lucky, you might be able to do what we call a PE3B strategy. So the PE3B strategy requires that you have a PAM that happens to be on the opposite strand and close to the site that you're trying to edit. So for example, if you're trying to do a plus one T to G mutation here, you'll notice that there's a PAM on the bottom strand. And what PE3B is, what this allows you to do, is it allows you to design your nicking guide so that it can only target that top strand after the RT has already synthesized your you know, mutant flap. So for example, if we're using this bottom PAM, we'll have this nicking guide protospacer here. And you'll see that this C here does not perfectly match with the T that is in the original wild type allele, but it does match perfectly with the G, which is the edit that you want to encode. So this nicking guide is only perfectly matched after the first several steps of prime editing have happened, which is really beneficial because this can decrease the level of indels that you see. And we've used PE3B strategies to really improve editing to indel ratios at a few different sites um, in our lab. So those are kind of the main considerations for the nicking guide. In many ways, it's much simpler than the peg RNA. You're really just finding protospacers. There's no need to design an, an EPEG motif or a PBS or an RTT or anything like that. Um, oh, and one other note about PE3B is that I think everyone I know who has tried to design a PE3B strategy at one point has thought that they could do this with the PAM itself. Um, but you cannot do this with the PAM, only with protospacer bases, because what you're recognizing is the other strand, whereas the PAM is on, on this bottom strand here. That's just like a really common error that a lot of people make, myself included. Um, so watch out for that. Okay. Um, the last thing, or sorry, one of the last things that you'll need to um, think about and I haven't really mentioned this before, is the addition of silent mutations. Um, so just to kind of contextualize when these are useful, let's go back to our original edit, this plus 11 G to T. Let's say you found an optimal PBS, you found an optimal RTT, you do prime editing, and this is kind of that same intermediate we talked about with the mismatch. Um, this is well on its way to being edited, but there are a few problems with this intermediate. Problem number one is that this TC mismatch forms a kind of mismatch DNA bubble that is very efficiently recognized by cellular mismatch repair. So, um, you know, we've talked about competing back to the wild type allele versus the edited allele. So this type of mismatch, kind of the shape of this distorted DNA helix is going to be a very good substrate for reversion back to the wild type allele. The other problem with this intermediate is that even if let's say that you do resolve this mismatch the way you want and your edit is installed on both strands, you still have a PAM intact here, which means that the prime editor can come back, nick again, reverse transcribe again, and potentially mess up your edited product. We can get around both of these problems by installing silent mutations in the RTT in the same way that we install the desired edit. So you wanna make sure that these don't change amino acids or anything else significant about your site, but it can be very helpful to say, have an RTT like this one with these silent mutations with this G and this C encoded in the PEG RNA here. And if you use this kind of silent mutation containing RTT instead of the original one, your intermediate will look a little bit more like this. And this is beneficial for a couple reasons. So one, this bubble is now not just a single base mismatch. Um, it's now kind of this larger distortion of the DNA helix, which counterintuitively is actually recognized less strongly by cellular mismatch repair machinery. So this is more likely to evade MMR proteins that would like to revert your edit back to the wild type allele. Secondly, this PAM or, you know, this TCG sequence is no longer a PAM, right? The PAM has been mutated. So after editing, you can't have the prime editor protein come back, re -nick, and start the whole process over again. So these two modifications really help this intermediate get converted to an edited outcome and stay there after editing is completed. So that's how we use silent mutations to enhance prime editing efficiencies. And then finally, we've kind of already touched on this, but I think it's worth um, considering more from an experimental design perspective is that there are five prime editing systems, PE1 through five. And, you know, each one kind of lends itself to certain applications, but not all applications. Um, the only one that you'll never want to use is PE1. Like I said, this was a really useful prototype. It was absolutely necessary for the invention of prime editing, but it's never going to be the most efficient thing to use. 
kind of the baseline that you would want to start out with is PE2. And this is just the Cas9 RT PEG RNA system. Um, there's no NICN guide, there's no MLH1DN. Um, honestly, this is probably never going to be the most efficient approach, but it is nice in that it's the simplest. So let's say that you're just screening PEG RNAs and you don't want to have to worry about optimizing a NICN guide just yet. You don't really want to mess with MLH1DN, inhibiting cellular mismatch repair. Um, PE2 might be a good place to start. But if you really want to get good editing efficiencies, what I would recommend is the PE3 or PE5 systems. So both of these use an additional NICN guide that can boost editing efficiency, um, and PE5 also uses MLH1DN. And choosing between these two systems is going to depend on a few different things. The first one is going to be your edit type. So um, like we mentioned in the silent edit slide, MLH1DN, um, a mismatch repair in general really recognizes these single mismatch um, mutations. So if your target edit is a SNP, um, it's very likely that MLH1DN will help. If you're doing a longer insertion or a longer deletion, it's less likely that MLH1DN will help. I think our cutoff is like four to five base pairs usually. Um, so that's one way you can choose between PE3 and PE5. If you have a lot of indels in the PE3 system, you might want to switch to PE5 because PE5 has been shown to minimize indels. Um, but on kind of on the other hand, if you don't want to inhibit cellular mismatch repair globally, you might want to stick with PE3. So I think of PE3 and PE5 as kind of similar, um, but certain aspects of your application or your edit type might tip the scales one way or the other. And then PE4 is kind of an intermediate, um, so it just uses MLH1DN, but no NICN guide. Um, it's useful because it probably has the highest editing to indel ratio of all of these systems. So if you have an especially indel prone site, it could be very useful. Um, but I think its biggest um, help is really for screening PEG RNAs, because much like PE2, you don't need to worry about, you know, optimizing a NICN guide RNA at the same time. But, um, you know, this is probably going to be more efficient than PE2. So those are kind of the scenarios where you might choose one PE system over the other, or sometimes, you know, we might test out two of them for a certain edit. Um, it just kind of depends on how much you're willing to optimize. The nice thing is that there are certain things that you should always use. Like I've mentioned, you should always use an EPEG RNA. They really improve editing efficiency. And um, the PE Max architecture, which is just... Um, you can use in any of these prime editing systems. So you might hear me say PE3 max, for example. Um, that just means that the prime editor protein is codon optimized and uses optimized linkers, um, optimized NLS sequences, and a few Cas9 mutations. So you should always use those two things to enhance editing efficiency. So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, let's say I have managed to choose just one protospacer. Um, I now have nine PBS RTT combinations, maybe three NICN guides. Maybe I want to choose a couple different silent edits and maybe try with and without MLH1DN. Um, this can kind of become a very overwhelming matrix very quickly. Um, but I think if you just kind of do it kind of layer by layer, and I'll talk about how our lab does this, it's actually possible to optimize all of these things without using a huge amount of resources or time or sanity for that matter. So typically what our lab does um, is that no matter what we plan on doing with the prime editing approach, we always start in a very easy to work with workhorse cell line that we've engineered to have the exact target edit that we want to um, correct. So if we're doing a human genome target, we'll use HEC293 T cells. And if we're you know, hoping to do a mouse model of something, we'll work in N2A cells. It's really helpful to have a workhorse cell line that's easy to transfect because you're going to be screening a lot of different combinations. So sometimes we'll use prime editing itself or we'll use HDR or base editing, some technique to install, you know, maybe a pathogenic edit. And then we'll make a clonal cell line in HEC293T or N2A cells of that edit. So then we have this really useful platform to do the screens in. We'll then use Golden Gate cloning or Gibson cloning or some other method to clone um, a small small initial library. I hesitate to say even library because it's only about you know nine to twelve plasmids initially of PEG RNAs. 
In terms of an initial first pass experiment, there are kind of two different ways our lab does things. So one thing we might do, like I mentioned, is we'll say, we don't wanna worry about making guides right off the bat. That's just gonna confuse things and lead to too many samples. So we'll do either PE2 or PE4, so with or without MLH1DN. And the only thing we'll optimize is those PBS and RT template lengths. So that's one kind of first pass experiment we might do. The other type of first pass experiment we might do is say, okay, we'll optimize PBS and RTT lengths, but we'll also screen a couple of nicking guides. Um, and both of these approaches are a reasonable number of samples. So the top one is typically, like I said, nine to 12 samples per replicate. And the bottom approach is, you know, if you multiply that by three for each nicking guide, um, you know, like 27 to 36. So if you're doing this in an easy to work with transfectable cell line in a 96 well plate, which is what our lab does, it ends up being a reasonable number of things to screen. Um, so after that first pass experiment, what you'll do, so you'll have these peg RNAs, each one will be transfected into its own well of a 96 well plate in this nice cell line that you've made. You know, maybe you're going to use MLH1DN because you don't want to optimize nicking guides. So you'll have your first pass experiment, you'll do a transfection, and then you'll perform HTS or whatever readout that you're going to do three days later. And you'll kind of have, you'll see where you initially land with your editing efficiency. And this kind of first pass outcome can be very different between different types of edits and different sites. So once you kind of see what your starting point is, it's then kind of up to you, the number of rounds of iteration that you want to do to improve. And you know, if you're just using prime editing to kind of, um, install a mutation and then you can screen clones. Maybe you really don't need the editing to be that efficient. If it's a therapeutics project or you want to do in vivo editing in a mouse, you'll probably want to get the editing efficiency as high as you can. So then you can start iterating. So first of all, you know, maybe you see patterns based on your PBS and RT template lengths. Maybe the longest RT template length you tried gave the best editing. So you might want to kind of go back and test even longer ones out. If you become happy with the RTT and PBS lengths that you screen, you can then start layering in these other improvements that we've talked about. So adding nicking guides, adding MMR evading mutations, um, adding PIM mutations, um, and then kind of using MLH1DN, testing these things in combination. So it's really all about how many things you're willing to test and um, you know, do you wanna do it iteratively to save resources or do you wanna do it all in parallel to save time? Um, this is just kind of an example of a campaign done in our lab. So these are for two different edits. The top one is for CXCR4 in orange, and the bottom is for this IL2RB edit shown in blue. And this was um, the results of an initial PBS and RTT screen in HEC 293T cell. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> HEC 293T cells. Um, and what's kind of cool is that you can see from this data that you know, there are different PBS and RTT preferences between edits. So this top edit here, it doesn't really seem like the PBS length is so sensitive, but for this one, you really only have one combination that's doing much better than your other lengths. So um, this really does show that you just have to test a few things if you're doing a new edit. You can then select your best one. So for example, the 17.3% here and this 4.72% here and start layering in these other improvements. So this is just showing, um, I think really beautifully how different prime editing improvements can stack together and take you from something that's really um, not usable to something that's pretty robust and something you might actually want to use in a project. So for example, this top one, it's that same edit from before. If you're doing PE2, you're only getting, you know, maybe 2% editing when you start to use the PE max architecture that you should always use and EPEG RNAs that you should always use um, and add an MLH1DN to get to PE4. You know, you go from sub 5% to about 15%. And then if you layer on a nicking guide RNA with that, you can boost editing efficiency even further. So I think um, this data really demonstrates that it's worth kind of going beyond that first pass experiment, doing maybe two or three rounds of optimization to really get um, large improvements in editing efficiency. Um, this blue graph on the bottom, this IL2RB edit, I think shows something else that's important to consider when you're optimizing a prime editing approach. And that's that all of these different improvements can kind of interact with each other. So if you look at these two bars here, um, we're not using any silent MMR evading edits and your improvement from PE3 to PE5 with the addition of MLH1DN is really large. So you're maybe doubling your editing efficiency when you add MLH1DN.
But when you include these MMR evading edits, um, the PE3 editing efficiency increases a lot. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because both silent edits that kind of distort the helix and MLH1DN are doing the same thing and that they're helping your edit evade MMR. So it kind of makes sense that the relative differences between these two bars would be different um, depending on the silent mutations that you're using. So you'll go through many rounds of iteration. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, you'll go through many rounds of iteration and it does really pay off. Um, but if this is all kind of overwhelming to you, if you don't want to spend weeks optimizing your prime editing approach, I do want to point out that there has been work from three other labs um, that is really interesting and exciting using machine learning um, and libraries of prime editors and prime editing efficiencies to predict um, which PEGRNA you should use for a new edit. So Henry Kim's lab has two papers on this. Leopold Parts's lab has one paper on this shown here. And then Gerald Schwank's lab has a paper on this as well. So all three of them have associated associated web tools where you can go to and you can plug in your wild type sequence and your desired edit, and it will kind of use this machine learning model that they've built to um, give you an estimate of the best peg RNA or the best five or 10 peg RNAs to use. Um, the only one that we've been able to, or sorry, the only one that we've tried to validate in our hands was the one from Gerald Schwank's lab, and that does produce pretty decent editing efficiencies right off the bat. Um, I think we're excited to try out the other two, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. So um, these are really exciting. And if you found the first um, chunk of this talk to be um, overwhelming or intimidating, then this is a great place to start. And um, they'll definitely give you something to work with. Um, another kind of theme of tools from other labs that we use all the time for prime editing is that when we analyze prime editing outcomes, we use the Crispresso 2 software from the um, Pinello lab. And I'm not going to go into too many details for this because a lot of it is just the same as you might use for another genome editing approach, but there are a few things that we use for prime editing um, that I think are pretty important to remember. So first is um, this discard indel read, setting it to true. What this does is this throws out um, indel containing reads. So A, you're not counting anything with an indel in it as an edit. And it's also a very easy way to keep track of your indels because you can just count the discarded reads. Um, another thing that's important is this quantification window, this QWC value. And what this dictates is where you'll be looking for indels, where the program will be looking for indels. So, um, sorry, okay. So um, for prime editing, there are two different places where we can really see indels coming in. So one is where the peg RNA nicks. So for example, around here, and then the other, if you're using PE3 or PE5, will be around here. So there are kind of two places where you can see indels cropping up, and it's really important to include this entire range in your um, kind of indel window. So um, the QWC value you can define as 10 bases before your first NIC, covering the whole region until 10 base pairs after your second NIC, and that allows you to accurately and completely quantify your indels. Um, so at this point, we've kind of gone through the whole prime editing workflow. I just want to touch on some controls, both positive and negative, that are going to be really important and really informative to include. The first one, by far the most important, is an untreated control, which sounds obvious, but if you're working with a very small number of cells to start with, it's very easy to get contamination from the environment or from you. Um, and, you know, if you're working with a patient-derived cell line, it's not always clear what their starting genotype is. So the untreated control is really important for making sure that any desired or undesired things that you see in your sequencing output are from the prime editor. Another important control, if you're doing prime editing for the first time, um, it's probably going to be helpful to include a really well-characterized edit in addition to whatever edit you're trying to optimize. So for example, doing just a single base change at the HEC3 locus using one of the many EPEG RNAs that we've published at this site um, and making sure that you can hit the values that our lab has published is going to be really helpful just to make sure that as you're building a prime editing workflow in your lab that um, you're able to do everything well. If you're kind of testing a new cell line, for example, a cell line that prime editing hasn't been reported in before and you're maybe electroparating mRNA or something, it's helpful to test those same reagents in a cell line that we know supports prime editing just as a QC check on your RNA. 
And then finally, just kind of a related note, um, prime editing efficiency is really affected by transfection efficiency when you're working with HEC-293Ts or N2As. So if you're comparing conditions, it's good to do that in the same experiment side by side to account for any kind of transfection um, differences in day-to-day -day or biological replicate to biological replicate. Okay, so that is um, pretty quickly how to optimize and kind of um, perform a prime editing experiment in mammalian cells. And we've kind of gotten to this point here where you've optimized your editing approach. And I just want to hit on um, really quickly two applications from our lab that have applied an optimized prime editing approach either with RNA delivery or with AAV delivery. So this first example was led by Kelsey Everett from our lab in collaboration with St. Jude. And what she did was she optimized a prime editing approach for correction of the sickle cell disease mutation. And then she delivered the prime editing components as mRNA. So she used a synthetic PEG RNA and Nick and guide RNA from IDT and Synthigo. And she herself did um, in vitro transcription to make PE Max mRNA. She and her collaborators electroporated all of this prime editing machinery into patient HSCs from sickle cell patients, and then they transplanted the edited cells into mice. Um, several weeks later, they harvested um, the mice and they checked A, the genotypes. So um, they were able to see really robust prime editing in the HSCs, which translated to, you know, editing later on from the harvested mouse tissue, um, up to 40% here. And then the really exciting thing is that you can see a decrease in the sickling phenotype in the prime edited treated cells. Um, so this is just a nice example of using mRNA delivery and electroporation of the prime editing components to execute a therapeutically relevant edit. Another delivery method that has, you know, only been published in the past maybe two weeks or so is using dual AAV delivery of prime editing components to install and edit in vivo. So Jesse Davis and Samagia Benskoda in our lab developed a prime editing approach for this dominant negative PCSK9 mutation, um, and they used this split PE2 max system to deliver the prime editor, PEG RNA, and NIC and guide to the mouse liver in this dual AAV system. They were able to achieve about 40% editing in vivo in the mouse liver, and this led to a corresponding reduction in LDL produced in the mice. Um, so this is just kind of, you know, if your target is an in vivo target, there are dual AAV prime editing systems that you can use. All right, so um, we're kind of at the end here to quickly summarize. Um, if you have a new prime edit that you want to do, the optimal prime editing parameters are going to depend on your edit type, the locus, your goal, you know, later down the road cell type, and then you should also be thinking about how you'll deliver these things and what efficiency you need to achieve the outcome that you want. Um, and this can all be very overwhelming, but I think the main takeaway from this webinar is that there are concrete guidelines and tools that you can use to make these choices. You don't have to screen every single thing. Um, to get, you know, a usable amount of editing efficiency. Um, and I just want to do a few plugs for the lab. So everything I've talked about today is summarized and honestly in greater detail in the Nature Protocols paper that we published. And a lot of really useful constructs are available on AdGene. So um, in vitro transcription templates, PE Max, um, the AAV constructs I believe are going on there. Um, and then if you want to stay plugged in for future prime editing updates, definitely check out the lab website. And I think um, David and the lab both tweet a lot about advances in prime editing from our lab and other labs. All right, so with that, I will um, do acknowledgments and then we'll take questions. Um, first of all, thanks to David. Um, I just finished my PhD in his lab and it was absolutely fabulous. And he's built um, this amazing technology that we've all been able to work on and contribute to. Um, a huge thanks to Peyton for moderating, and I'll just give a brief background on Peyton because he'll be answering questions too. Um, yeah, so Peyton developed um, with James Nelson EPEG RNAs that have been really beneficial for prime editing, and Peyton was also involved in the original report of prime editing, so I'm super um, excited to hear his take on some of the questions that we get later. And Peyton also worked on this protocol paper with me and Alex Sousa, who co-led it, as well as Dr. Peter Chen and Dr. Anahita Vieira. And then I want to shout out a few other members of the lab whose work I summarized today and um, kind of my go-to Lou Lab picture is this one of all of us on Halloween. Um, and I will let you try to pick out various people in the picture. Um, and last and most of all, thanks to all the bioprotocol folks for inviting us to talk. Um, this has been a ton of fun and um, we really just appreciate the chance to come and chat. So um, yeah, with that, I think we can start doing questions. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, 
I guess we can just get right into it. The questions have been rolling throughout the whole uh, webinar. Um, so looking through it, we have uh, some a couple questions. So I guess I'll start off with this because they're all tying into the sort of same vein of what does prime editing efficiency using other variants of Cas9, PAM variants, other orthologs, how does that compare with regular uh, SP Cas9? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, honestly, it's not great. I think um, people in our lab have had some luck with SP Cas9 PAM variants. So like NG, I think does okay. And some of the um, Cas9 variants published by um, Shannon Miller and Tina Wang and NBT also do all right. But um, sorry, I'm trying to get to a slide. Um, in general, like SA Cas9 does not perform well as a prime editor, um, which is kind of a shame. But I think one of the things that's important to remember when asking those types of questions, okay, we are here, is that um, unlike base editing, for example, where you really need a PAM to be in a certain spot in order to do base editing, you have a lot more flexibility with prime editing. So for example, um, if you're trying to edit this target base, you can do it from either strand. So this protospacer or this protospacer will both work. Um, and your kind of prime editing window is very wide. So um, for example, if you were trying to do base editing, you'd be restricted to like these like four or five bases around here. But with prime editing, you can do basically anything downstream of the NIC. Um, and you can also get quite far away from your desired edit um, and have efficient editing still. So for example, one of the most efficient edits we have is the plus 26 G to C at the heck three locus, which is you know very far from the NIC, but still works well. So I would honestly, like if I was doing a prime editing experiment and there wasn't a good NGG PAM, I would just try to do something from farther away or I would use twin prime editing, which can you know do changes from even further away. Um, and we didn't talk about twin prime today, but if there are questions about that, we can happily answer them. But I would rather do something like that than use a non-SP Cas9, at least for now. You know, it's funny that you end on Talking about twin prime editing, there is a question uh, from Nicholas in the Q and A section. How does twin prime editing compare to the P to PE three, assuming that there is a protospacer that is of uh, reasonable or I guess comparable distance? Okay, great. Well, we are already here. Um, so I think PE three and twin prime, there's very little overlap where you would use each system. So in general, if you're doing like a snip or maybe a five base pair insertion, something pretty small, um, you'll definitely go with PE3 over twin prime. Um, if you want to do a large change, like maybe completely recode 50 nucleotides, you would want to use twin prime. So just for the people who don't know, twin prime is when you basically do prime editing on two opposite strands of DNA. And then instead of having your RTTs be complementary to the endogenous locus, they're complementary to each other. So they basically anneal, and then you can recode sequences in between NICs. Um, let's say that you have an edit that's you know maybe 30 base pairs long that you could in theory do with PE3 or twin prime. Um, I would say usually twin prime will be better if you can find a good protospacer pair. Um, but that's not always the case, but that's like the general rule. Okay, so moving on now to going more into use of these silent mutations to help uh, evade mismatch repair. So mm -hmm. Sarah is asking, uh, do they have to be close to each other to create a bubble? And as a follow-up, how does inclusion of these silent mutations impact your uh, sort of your three prime extension design, the design of that RT template and how much uh, homology, et cetera. This is a great question. Thank you for asking this. Um, so we want it to be pretty close to the edit. So I think in this example, I have it being right next to it. That's obviously not always possible because it could introduce an amino acid change you don't want, something like that. I think the rule of thumb is within five base pairs um, of your target edit. And another thing that's um, because, you know, you've brought this up is that not all silent edits are equally effective in um, evading MMR. So um, the paper to look at for that is um, Peter Chen et al. Cell 2021. Um, he goes really in depth about how to use these silent edits to improve prime editing efficiency. So that's kind of the first part of the question. 
Second part is, um, it's, I think the question about how to design the RTT after you've included a silent edit is a good one. Um, I kind of mentioned that if you have a larger change, we like to give more downstream homology to help with the flap equilibration. So, you know, if you've installed, let's say, three different silent edits adjacent to your SNP, you might want to look into lengthening your RT template to see if the optimal RTT length has stayed the same, or maybe if you want to use one that's a little bit longer. That was a good question. Okay, so next question uh, from Vikas. Is it okay to add the uh, glycine tRNA sequence of around 77 base pairs, which is used in plants to direct RNA to the meristem or flowers uh, at the end of T for pre-Q1 in an EPEG RNA? I guess this is an EPEG RNA centric question. You take it, Peyton. Take this one. Um, so I guess neither of us have much experience, Jordan more than I do. I do with regards to genome editing in plants. Um, however, I can certainly say that uh, adding this structured RNA motif to the end of your three prime extension um, should be absolutely tolerated with regards to a, a functional egg RNA for prime editing. In fact, um, if length of the species is a concern, um, depending on the promoter you're using to express your egg RNA, uh, they definitely have certain length limits. U6, for example, starts to taper off around 300 um, nucleotides. So you could even consider substituting the TIVO pre P1 motif for your tRNA sequence um, if length is a concern. But if not, it absolutely should be able to be tolerated, um, barring you know, some unlucky interaction between the motif and your new tRNA sequence. Um, OK, so going on. Uh, so, uh, considering the recent preprint from the Shandur lab on the impact of chromatin organization on prime editing efficiency, would you estimate that PE6 approaches will include CRISPR-A like strategies? Hmm. Okay. I will admit I have not read this preprint, although I am familiar with it. Um, I definitely think it's possible. Um, Peyton, do you remember what the big takeaways of that paper were? I have not read it yet. I can comment that essentially um, as, as not a huge surprise, I guess, considering that just Cas9 itself has been shown to be impacted by chromatin state of regions you're targeting. There are sort of similar effects that are correlating with prime editing efficiency. Um, so it's, I guess it's interesting to think about how we could sort of try to manipulate chromatin state um, in order to boost prime editing efficiencies. Of course, this all has to be balanced that this is already a large system. Uh, many of everyone's interesting applications will be constrained by size. And so those, those strategies need to be tolerated in the sort of uh, settings where we're interested in and also not uh, go over uh, packaging limits. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great point. And to add on to that too, I think um kind of the chromatin context is something that, you know, I think these um Pegrene design papers, they've all used these really great library approaches to look at the effects of different sequences, but you know, a lot of them are like lentivirally integrated, so we're not really examining a diversity of chromatin states with libraries like these. So I think um that's kind of an area that's been like less well explored, for example, than like the sequence preferences. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what people find there. But yeah, I agree with Peyton. The prime editor is already very big. Um, this dual AAV system that Jesse and Smagia made was already like a very Herculean effort. It like barely fits and they had to do a lot of optimization. Yeah. Okay, so touching on, I guess, the first question that was asked from Thenavon, uh, how do you minimize the off-target effects of prime editing? Any form of gene editing technology like CRISPR, prime editing, base editing, uh, shown to have bystander effects. How do we design experiments so that these effects are minimized? Another good question. I should have had a slide on this, um, and I didn't have a slide on this because off-target editing is actually not a huge problem for prime. And I think the reason why is kind of hidden in this slide. Um, so for normal CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, so Cas9 nuclease, or for base editing, 
Um, all of your targeting is based on one kind of homology or complementarity event, which is this protospacer target genome interaction. So when you have that in other spots in the genome, you get off-target editing. Um, but for prime editing, there are kind of a lot of other checkpoints in place where you need certain things to be complementary in order to get an off-target. So not only do you need to have um, an off-target that's a very similar sequence to your protospacer, but you also need this PBS to match really well. Um, and you also need this kind of downstream homology to match really well. So just kind of as you layer in, okay, you need the protospacer to match, you need the PBS to match, and um, mismatches in the PBS are not very well tolerated. I think that was actually in um, the latest Henry Kim paper. Um, but yeah, you also need the downstream homology to be um, pretty close. So I think just the odds of all three of those things happening at any given off-target site are really low. Um, so in general, people have detected, they've detected off-targets for prime, but they're usually very, very um, infrequent. Okay, just as a, a one quick question from Sarab again. On your slide, it noted to avoid starting the RTT with a C. Um, what was the reasoning behind this, and is it specific to MMLB? Hmm. Um, yes, let's go back to that slide. I have all of my like animations. Okay. Um, so the reason that we typically don't start the RTT with a C, um, you can imagine the pegRNA is kind of coming off of the three prime end of the Cas9 guard RNA scaffold. And it's not really shown here. I don't have a good illustration for it. But if you look kind of on the other side of this hairpin in the scaffold, it's actually a G there. So if you extend um, that hairpin with a C, like if you start, oh, sorry, that should be up here. That was my bad, sorry. Um, so if you extend this hairpin by making the first base of your RTT a C, then you're kind of um, increasing this hairpin. And um, we've just kind of noticed that when we do that, the editing tends to be worse. Um, I think in the original prime editing paper, there's a figure where you can see that every time you start the RTT with a C, your editing takes a hit. Um, so it's because of that, um, we think, we haven't proven, but we think it's because of that hairpin interaction in the scaffold. Okay, so yes. Um, can Cas9, in the case, mRNA, well, I'm assuming prime editor, uh, mRNA, as well as pegRNA, be co-encapsulated for lipid nanoparticle? delivery from Wise Corner Labs? Hmm, hmm. Um, let's see, we haven't really done that in our lab. Um, I've seen like some presentations on using lipid delivery of prime, um, but most of the RNA work that we've done in our lab is electroporation. Yeah. Um, so I can't comment on that too much. I don't know if you have anything to add, Peyton. I think we've, we're thinking of similar presentations where it has been shown that you can get some editing uh, via this delivery strategy, um, but certainly not something our lab has a ton of experience with. Yeah, if we're um, usually if we're doing at least in our lab in our hands, usually if we're doing RNA delivery, it's some sort of ex vivo situation or patient derived cell type, and we'll use like a Lanza electroporator. And then if we're trying to do something in vivo, we'll typically turn to AAV, but that's probably just kind of based on preference more so than it being possible or not. Roman is asking about the peg RNA. Do you recommend to clone it into a plasmid or to synthesize it and transfect directly? Hmm. Yes, um, you should definitely when you're starting out, right? Because like we've talked about, you'll be screening, you know, probably around a dozen, maybe even more peg RNAs. Um, so if you try to order all of those as, you know, um, and we also order our peg RNAs when we do use synthetic pegs, we order them modified. So they end up being quite expensive. So you definitely would not want to do that right off the bat. It would be um, a huge cost to order, you know, every peg RNA that you would want to screen as a synthetic peg. So that's why we start out with everything as a plasmid. So we'll screen our initial set of ePEG RNAs as plasmids, um, and we clone them just, you know, by ordering oligos that encode the um, spacer and the RTT and the PBS. Um, that's all summarized um, pretty thoroughly in the Nature Protocols paper, but um, definitely start out as plasmid optimize everything in a plasmid situation. And then if you have a really efficient system that you're comfortable with, then you can bite the bullet and buy the expensive, you know, synthetically modified PEG RNA from IDT. 
Great. And then Svetlana is asking about what kind of techniques uh, can be used to uh, enrich for successfully edited clones after. Uh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, so something that we use in our lab, um, I'll stay on this slide, even though it's not explicitly shown here. So um, like a lot of genome editing tools, if you have a lot of prime editor, you're more likely to get good prime editing. So we have like PEMAX, P2A, GFP constructs. So we'll flow sort for highly expressing GFP cells, which means they have a lot of PEMAX, which means they're more likely to have been edited than you know your cells that didn't get a lot of prime editor. So that's one thing we do. I've seen a few other papers. I'm forgetting the labs where they'll have like a prime editing reporter, um, and then they'll be able to flow sort, not for their edit exactly, but kind of like a proxy edit. Um, so I think it's kind of a similar thing to what we do of just selecting for cells that got a lot of prime editor in them. Okay. Um, just a quick one from Sarah. Uh, just refreshing again, what is PE Max and how does its architecture uh, differ from PE2? Yeah, I did breeze right through that. Um, let me pull up something relatively close to that. Okay, um, so if this is kind of your non-maxed prime editor, um, there are a bunch of changes in PE max. So um, one is the linker between um, the RT and the Cas9. The linkers have been optimized. Um, this is just kind of a standard thing in genome editing that you know, the relative orientation of the two domains can be improved by different linkers. Um, there are two Cas9 mutations that were previously shown to increase nuclease activity that have been included in PEMAX. The RT has also been codon optimized in PEMAX. And I believe as part of the linker optimization, there's also now an NLS in one of the linkers, so more nuclear localization as well. Um, so kind of, they're just changes that enhance the editor's expression, um, you know, it's nuclear localization, and then these Cas9 mutations. And um, that's also in the Chen cell paper from 2021. And he shows that um, it might not even really help so much in hex cells, but once you get into other cell types, like HSCs, for example, in Kelsey's paper, and um, in HeLa cells, for example, you see it helping way more in those cases. Okay, and then from Sigmund, uh, do you know if there has been any work on ways to make repeated sequential edits on the same locus using these approaches, which I think I can address. Uh, there is a paper for this, you're in luck, um, from Jay Shinder's group. Uh, it's a Nature 2022 paper using a system they call DNA typewriter, essentially using prime editing for recording molecular events as, as you're interested via um, editing into the same locus repeatedly. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, it's been a lot of great questions so far. Thank you all for your interest in our work. Um, Sonali asks, uh, as you are working Primarily with prime editing in animals, I still wanted to ask, can you suggest what the best strategies for prime editing in plants to maximize efficiency would be? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would refer to you um, to, there's a whole suite of papers from Taisha Gao's lab, um, NVT for most of them, I believe, Nature Biotech. Um, her lab has put a tremendous amount of effort into optimizing prime editors in plants. Um, and there are some interesting differences between mammalian cell and plant cells. Like I think um, they find that removing the RNase H domain from the RT helps a lot in plant cells, but not in mammalian cells. So um, there are definitely some differences. So check out work from her lab for that. Um, they've done a lot of good stuff. Yes. Um, and then. Uh... Wise Corner Labs is asking about um, what if the non-spacer regions of the pegRNA could uh, bind to genomic DNA, uh, perhaps in an off-target sense or just a competition sense when it comes to successful editing? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I mean, my knee-jerk reaction is that they probably wouldn't do anything. Um, I think I think the risk of it affecting off targets is very low, just because I don't think it would be oriented properly to kind of catalyze anything um, 
But I think um, the other point about, you know, what if it's soaking up the peg RNA for some reason, um, that's an interesting thought. Um, I don't think we've seen any evidence that that, that that is like happening, but I don't think anyone has really carefully looked. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting point. We typically worry more about those parts of the peg RNA being complementary to other parts of the peg RNA more so than like the genome. Um, like if your peg RNA is like folded in on itself in a weird way or complementary to the scaffold, um, that can cause problems. Um, so that's kind of what we worry about more in terms of accidental hybridizations, but um, that's an interesting point. Okay. Okay. Um... Have you looked into, from Surab, uh, have you looked into flap exonucleases involved in prime editing, similar to TREX1, I guess, referring to uh, Leopold Parts' work? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, our lab doesn't have anything out on that, but Leopold Parts' paper does. Um, so just to kind of go into it a little bit more, um, it is this, um, It's I've represented the entire paper with this one graph here on the left, but um, they basically did this kind of predictive library model for large insertions. And what they found was that when you um, made your insertions longer and longer, the effects of these like TREX1, TREX2 nucleases became more pronounced. So um, some work has been done on that. You can see this paper right here for more details. Um, but I think like almost everything else related to prime editing, it is an end edit dependent effect, and it seems to disproportionately affect longer edits. Okay, and then from Morali, what is the largest insertion made using twin prime? And I guess mm -hmm. I'll add perhaps this is a good opportunity to uh, maybe talk about passage a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, comparison point. Yes, um, that is a great point, Peyton. So um, I would say in terms of just twin prime alone, the largest insertion is probably just over a hundred base pairs. Peyton, correct me if that was wrong, but that's about the ballpark I feel. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, if you want to say insert a whole gene, prime editing can still help you do that in a way that's programmable. So what Peyton referenced passage um, is what we call when we use twin prime editing to install a recombinase site. So um, these recombinase sites are usually about 40 or so base pairs, give or take, depending on the recombinase. So you can use twin prime to replace um, the sequence between two protospacers and replace it with, for example, this at B sequence here. Once you've inserted the recombinase site, you can then treat with the recombinase. So in this example from the twin prime paper, um, they treated with BXB1 and then um, a donor gene. It was about um, five KB for this example. Um, so, you know, quite large gene sized cargos. And then you can use the recombinase to insert the entire gene into this kind of landing pad that you've created with twin prime. Um, so, you know, it's a few more steps, but you can do very large insertions using twin, pl twin prime plus a recombinase. Okay, and then from Nicholas, uh, how important is a linker region between the end of the scaffold and before the peg extension? Would the linker be transcribed? And if so, will it affect flap resolution? I guess this is another sort of peg RNA centric question. Um, which I can talk about. So I'm doing a little bit of interpretation here. I guess in typical PEG RNA and EPEG RNA uh, designs, we don't have a sort of linker region sequence, so to speak, between the end of the scaffold, which would be sort of that terminal hairpin in the diagrams Jordan has used in this presentation before it enters into the sequence that would be a uh, template for the reverse transcriptase. Um, any sequence, within that sort of between those two regions would of course be expected to be reverse transcribed and um, most likely interfere with the ability of that uh, RT product to hybridize back to the genome as you now have a free end, which is not no longer homologous, which would negatively affect flap resolution. Um, so as we have characterized in the sort of the original prime editing paper, um, reverse transcription reaching into that actual scaffold sequence to incorporate usually just a, a few bases of that terminal hairpin sequence um, is commonly 
people, not commonly, but is detectable as one of the sort of um, byproducts of prime editing. However, it's it's always a relatively minor uh, product and uh, component of the indels which we quantify in these experiments. Um, so we're starting to run down on questions. So um, considering that 293T cells are deficient for MLH1, um, would you still advise optimizing pegRNA designs in this cell type? So perhaps getting at does the optimal extension design, is that affected by cell states such as MLH1 deficiency? That is a great question. Um, I feel like more work could be done on this. Um, my intuition is that if you're just optimizing PBS and RTT lengths and HEC 293 T cells, that's probably going to translate pretty well to other cell types, because at least in my mind, I think of those as more kind of thermodynamic principles of your PEG RNA. Um, things that I feel like might not translate as well when you're going between cell types are things like which nicking guide you should use. I could see that being a little bit more dependent on the DNA repair. And then like you mentioned, um, you know, MLH1DN, for example, isn't so helpful in HEC293 T cells because they're MMR deficient. But then when you put them, um, if you move from like HEC293 T cells to HeLa cells, which are MMR proficient, um, having MLH1DN helps a lot more in that cell type. So I would say the DNA repair flavor of things is something that you can re-examine when you transition between cell types, um, but the PEG RNA components less so. Okay, um, quick one from Oswald. Can prime editing be used to edit in mutations causing insecticide resistance um, in mosquitoes? I would imagine. What do you think? Yeah, assuming, uh, I mean, this is more a question of does, is DNA repair, are all of the major players involved in you know, carrying these edits forward still present mosquitoes? Neither of us are uh, entomologists, but um, in principle, yes, you should be able to use prime editing in these in these cell types. Essentially, that's what that um, is going after. Um, and I guess starting to wrap up then, per 